Um, I know that you so say in your book that you still had a lot of the problems that teenagers have, oh, emotional yeah. issues and things. Yes. So they were, but presumably they didn't have so much impact on you as they would have done but if, if you hadn't had this realisation? I, I suppose so. I, I definitely had a key for dealing with the normal problems. I, I did have all the normal problems, um, and still do. <laughs> yeah. But I have a key for dealing with it, a point of view, I, uh, paying attention. We say, just as I see it's face to no face, so it's problem to no problem. Yeah. So I'm viewing the problem from a place that's free of, of problems, and everyone is free of that of problems right where they are. And, but if you become conscious of that, it's a, a great tool, a great uh, help. And I think, really, what one thing is seeing who you really are, and then following that is exploring living from it, and in a way trusting it. So, uh, and just, just Richard, just tell us briefly about Douglas himself. You know, yes. there's a potted history of him in two or three minutes about how he came to uh, develop this technique and what and what he was like in his life. Yes. Well, Douglas was born in 1909 in Suffolk. Right. And his father was a member of a group called the Ex Exclusive Plymouth Brethren, which is a very strict Christian group. And they think they've got the, the way. Uh, surprise, surprise, isn't that unusual? <laughs> We've got the way and everyone else is going to hell. Yeah. And um, they really believed that. So I think they were deep but narrow. They, they really were sincere. Now, when Douglas was 21, he left. And he left, in, not quietly by the back door, but he wrote an essay uh, saying why he thought they couldn't be right, <laughs> why it was time for him to move on and uh, explore other things. So he was the worst case they'd ever had. He was not popular. <laughs> so he was, by then, training to be an architect, and he was in London. He'd moved from the country to London. And he, I suppose had decided he wasn't going to just take on trust what the Plymouth Brethren told him to believe. And then when he got to London, he thought, well, how do I know what society is telling me is right? I mean, let me go right to basics here. He had a, a basic sense of curiosity and a determination to find the truth, I think, and independency, and probably a bit of ambition as well. He wanted to be a great philosopher, I think, actually. Right. <laughs> and he... Uh, he started asking the question, really, in his in his twenties: Who am I? What am I? So this would be nineteenth in in the early thirties in London, when the it's depression. A pretty deep was question: Who am I? Who am I? What am I? Yeah. But he didn't want to join another group who told him. He wanted to work it out for himself. Yeah. And what was really uh, significant was into philosophy at this time were coming the ideas of relativity. A very simple idea. What something looks like depends partly on how far away you are from it. So uh, Douglas applied this to himself. Well, you see me from there as a person. But if you came up to me, and this is the modern approach, then I would change. And I would just be half a person, a face, an eye. If you could come even closer, then you'd find a layer of cells. And if you could go even closer with the right instruments, you'd find a layer of molecules, particles, peeling away my onion. So Douglas took this seriously and said, well, what I am really is different at different ranges. So if I, I'm a bit like an onion with layers, I mean, you could go further away and you'd see London and the planet and the stars. Yes, and the yeah. You need every one of these layers to sit here and breathe. Yeah. So by this time, when Douglas was working up this, out this kind of onion-like pattern to his own being, that he had many layers, he'd gone to India and he'd gone there with his family, not on a spiritual quest but he'd got a job there as an architect and then the war broke out and life uh, became uh, uh, I suppose uh, he felt the the risk of, of the war and he wanted to find out who was at the center of the onion before he died he wanted to find out who was alive before he died and uh, but he got a bit stuck I mean in terms of philosophy, you can almost peel away the last layer, but not quite. I mean, what is underneath the particles? That's, uh, this is what science is trying to find out in one direction. Yes. What is everything made of? That's right. So he applied the same question as science applies to objects to himself. He said, well, I'm just an object. What yes. am I? Yes. And um, he got stuck at this last layer. How do you find out what's, 
what is the so-called reality, if you like, behind all these appearances? And then one day he was reading a book and he found a picture in it which was drawn by Ernst Mach, who was an Austrian philosopher and physicist, and quite influential, uh, um, I think, to um, Einstein. He was a sort of early relativist and, and, and um, phenomenologist, I suppose. Anyway, this picture was a self-portrait. Now, now, most self-portraits you draw using a mirror, don't you? you I've never done it, but I guess you would. Yeah, yeah you yeah. get a mirror and, and yeah. there's your face and you yeah. get a piece of paper and you draw what you see in, in the mirror. So actually, this is a, a picture of what you look like at several feet. Okay. It's a picture of you as an object, isn't it? Okay. And what this picture was, was uh, what Ernst Mark looked like from his own point of view, not using a mirror. And in the picture, that you, you've got the room, and then you've got his legs, and you've got his torso, and then you, in the picture you've got his arm reaching out. <laughs> but you don't to the see his face. No. Ah. Right? And down back one side of the picture, you've got a huge nose going from the ceiling to the floor. Well, if I close my eye now, yeah, I, yeah. It, you see what I mean? <laughs> see, yeah. You've got the biggest nose in the room. <laughs> and he also, this guy had a moustache, and he drew his moustache. And it was a handlebar moustache, you know, big moustache, and it was as wide as the room, huh. all the way along the bottom of the picture. Huh. Of course, you don't see Ernst Mark's face. It's quite a well-known picture. I think 1890s or something it was drawn. And the guy just wanted to put aside all his ideas and just draw what he actually experienced. And when Douglas saw this, he thought, oh my God, I'm in the same condition. Now, I've got a different body, you know, coming out of, of here, but, but it disappears, it, it disappears, there's no mm -hmm. face here. Yeah. And so his whole thing really, in a way, was point of view. From your point of view, I've got a head. That's valid, but from my point of view, I, I don't find anything here, mm -hmm. there's sensations, but no, no, no object here, just awareness, you see. And I will take that view, my view, just as, uh, as being as valid as your view. Both are true. So this was when the penny dropped. This was Douglas discovering what was at the centre of the onion. All mm. the layers. Mm. Nothing at all. Mm. Full of a view out, a unique view out. But he still had his mind running. Yes, oh yeah. Well, part of the view out is your thoughts, you see. Yes. And your feelings and, and your reactions. Mm. But my thoughts now are coming and going in this empty space. Mm. And it's not something you can demonstrate outwardly. You can never prove you're, you're headless to someone else. So <laughs> They have to look for themselves. So the space for you is an infinite space? Well, let me have a look. Yes, it is. <laughs> That's the experimental approach, you see. Yeah. Not even remember what I experienced a minute ago. Let me have a look now. My hand disappears. I don't find any yeah. boundary to this emptiness. Look, you've brought some props. Oh, yes. So why don't we have a bit of a go? OK. And see, yes. I remember, I have to say that about 25 years ago, maybe longer actually, maybe 30, you know, a long time ago, I did do an afternoon with Douglas Harding. Ah, oh, yes. And I can't say I remember very much about it, and I can't say I got very much from it. So this mm. was the last time <laughs> that I had one of these. <laughs> So are we both, do I do it or we both do it? We both do it. Okay, all right. I, I, so. I just explain what it is. Yes. I, this is an experiment. So this, this is, yep. And it's for noticing the difference between what you look like to others and what you are for yourself, right? Okay. So very simply, if you look in the mirror, uh, uh, you'll see your face. So I can see myself. There's a, there's a, we should say there's a, show a little there's mirror a little, down here. Yeah, yeah. The okay. mirror. Yep. And a uh, hole in the card. Yes, well, I see my face. I think it's my face, yes. Yes, yeah. okay. And, and where is that appearance? That, my face is now over here. Yes. But I see it from here. Okay. But, but I only see one picture of a face. Well, I'm seeing it from here, but I only see one face and it's there. Correct. Okay. And uh, so your mirror shows you what you look like at... at about arm's length or something. Okay. And if yeah. you bring your, the mirror up to you a little bit, it shows you yeah. what it looks like at closer distance, and that's okay. different. Okay. And if you were to bring it right up, you get a blur. Okay. And then bring it away again. So your mirror is helping you show you how you appear at different distances. Yeah.